Tenakotu Katoa. My name's Nigel Wilson, and I'm sending this from New Zealand. And I've been asked to talk about prevention, treatment, and long-term management of ARF and rheumatic heart disease. So you will have heard that rheumatic fever is actually quite complicated because it starts as an infectious disease in childhood. And there's an immunological pathogenesis, which is still not clarified. And then it ends up with a non-communicable disease that is chronic rheumatic heart disease. So this causal pathway from the group A strep infection through to a rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease lends itself to where we can focus prevention, so-called primordial prevention, primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary treatment. And I'll cover some of these aspects today. So primordial prevention, obviously rheumatic heart disease affects those, the poorest populations of the world, and it's said to be a disease of the bottom billion. So, and it's, and so to improve living conditions, decreasing poverty and overcrowding in low and middle income countries is how primordial prevention can reduce the overall disease burden. I'll introduce three pillars of rheumatic fever knowledge today. And one of them is that without group A strep, there'd be no rheumatic fever. And that of course underpins primary prevention. So if we look at regions where primary prevention has been successful, we see it recorded in the 1960s in Baltimore, other regions, Costa Rica, French Caribbean, North American indigenous populations. And of course, it's not just treating strep A pharyngitis, but it's, it's, it's a concomitant improving living conditions, especially that, that was certainly the case for Baltimore and Costa Rica, raising community awareness, and also education of health professionals. So in New Zealand with rising rates in, in Maori and Pacific peoples, we started a, the government started a primary prevention program and it was based on swabbing throats in schools for those with, that had reported uh, pharyngitis. Obviously, increasing health literacy is important and increasing education, both of the population and of health professionals. And so we can see here in this graph that the first episodes of rheumatic fever, there were rising rates up in 2012-13. The, the primary prevention program was rolled out and there was a fall in, in rheumatic fever rates, but they rose again, likely because we haven't been able to to address the social determinants of health. Health literacy has pleasingly increased. It's a, it's a difficult concept, isn't it? That a sore throat should potentially end up with heart disease in, in a child who's 10 or 15 years of age. But we did have increasing health literacy. The ultimate primary prevention obviously would be a strep A vaccine. And efforts have been for many years, way, since going back to the 1920s. But it, so far, it's always been sort of 10 years away, the vaccine, when I, when I give these sort of talks. And it's in fact, the burden of disease is justified for a strep A vaccine, not just the 33 million rheumatic heart disease, but in fact, 162 million cases worldwide of cellulitis and pharyngitis. So it's the cellulitis that gives that the, the weight behind the health economics to start a vaccine. And so it's not just an invasive strip, of course, affects high income countries. This was a child in Australia who lost both her, her legs because of uh, overwhelming strep septicemia. So there is a group called the Strep A Vaccine Consortium, and they're well advanced over the last decade to develop a vaccine and it's led by Jerome Kinn and we hope that they will be successful in the coming years. So maybe finally less than 10 years away. Moving to secondary prevention. And obviously this is based on 
regular continuous administration of penicillin, which is my second pillar of rheumatic fever knowledge. And it, fortunately, strep A remains sensitive to penicillin. So the evident, this is evidence-based treatment that intramuscular is better than oral. So in the circle there, the intramuscular rates, very low rates of recurrences of rheumatic fever compared to those in the time course there, about one third had a recurrence. In New Zealand, in the 1990s, we looked at our program in Auckland and the program failure weight on four weekly intramuscular penzathine penicillin was 1.4 per 100 patient years. And the true penicillin failure rate where, where penicillin was documented, adherence was well documented, is as low as 0 0.07 per 100 patient years. You'll always get some recurrences for multiple reasons. So we only use four weekly, we only use three weekly if there has been, if there's been a recurrence on four weekly. Of course, the heroes are not the doctors, but the nurses who establish their rapport with the patients and the family that they get their penicillin either at home or at school. Audit is very important. So we did another audit re last recently and you see in the red bars are the new cases of rheumatic fever as expected, five to 15 to 20 year olds. But then the recurrences in fact are much higher in the, in the blue in the adolescents and adults. So they're opting out of, of secondary prevention. And so that's where we have to target our efforts to improve the overall, uh, to decrease the overall rate of recurrences. We have guidelines. And I'd recommend also the Australian guidelines and up there third edition if you Google RHD Australia website. And in our guidelines, we recommend a minimum of 10 years after the, the recent episode of, of ARF or to age 21, whichever is the longer. But importantly, in our last iteration, we say that you must reassess at the time of the cessation of prophylaxis. You don't commit them at the beginning because your moderate or mild disease may improve. So you reassess at age 21. But again, just to emphasize, it's, it's fascinating how people who don't see much rheumatic fever or are new to it, they think, oh, I'll just try oral. I'll just be nice and try oral penicillin. But it's so important that administrators and clinicians understand that IM penicillin is evidence-based compared to oral. I'm just going to pause there because and and just um just say to this is for sliders for Matt's. I've just gone back up. Um Matt's Wallander, who's our administrator today. I can't pause, so I'll just go straight on. This is just a photo to remind him of his time in New Zealand. So the autumn colours uh, where I am at the moment. Matt's uh, kindly helped with in our service over the last decade doing locum work. So moving on to priorities in management of rheumatic, of rheumatic fever first, we always admit to hospital because it can take a while to, to confirm the diagnosis with the evolution of joint joints um, or needing second streptococcal teeters. We refer to the public health and notify the disease when the diagnosis is made and hospitalization allows for good patient and family education about this complex illness, the need for dental care and endocarditis prophylaxis. We eradicate the strep with penicillin oral and then move on to the first injection. And we don't use aspirin uh, because of the side effects. Non-steroidals um, control symptoms very easily. What about the medical management of carditis? Um, so the evidence base is that penicillin obviously works indirectly because it's preventing recurrences and, and, and progression of rheumatic heart disease. Cardiac medications are evidence-based when there's symptoms for, and if there's ventricular dysfunction. But there's no good evidence that bed rest influences carditis. There's no evidence that salicylates have any influence on carditis. And there's no evidence of steroids or intravenous immunoglobulins. 
It's worth looking at the corticosteroid data. These were, these were five randomized controlled trials in this, in this meta-analysis. And you, it's dominated by the Rheumatic Fever Working Party, published in 1955. And we see that, that um, corticosteroids was no difference from aspirin, which is basically placebo. We tried intravenous immunoglobulin in the 1990s, published in circulation. And although those with, on the IVIG reduced the amount with RHD at one year, so did the placebo. We do need to pursue immunomodulator treatment for ARF. And the Australian scientists came up with the fact that, that, um, that dysregulated granulocyte macrocyte colony stimulating factors produce an overabundance of T helper cells. And these can be blocked in the test tube with hydroxychloroquine. And we used, we treated two children that had pro prolonged progressive rheumatic fever with hydroxychloroquine in 2019. And we're now doing an observational study to make sure that there's no uh, significant side effects of using hydroxychloroquine in the, in the ARF setting. Moving to management of rheumatic heart disease. This slide came from Jonathan Karapetis many years ago. And the dotted lines shows that the RHD disease burden is predominantly in young adulthood. And of course, the American investigators knew this and they described that RHD was the long shadow of rheumatic fever. So the third pillar of rheumatic fever knowledge is that severe RHD shortens life. But of course, it depends where, where you're living, how much it shortens it. If you've got severe RHD in Ethiopia, your life expectancy is age 25. In Fiji, it's 37. In New Zealand, it's, it's better, but it's still 25 years than the rest of the population's life expectancy. So there's one good news in this story of chronic RHD is that, and this is one of the most important facts, is that when there is no or mild or moderate carditis, you've got a very good chance of having no significant heart disease after, after your 10 years of penicillin in the absence of a recurrence of rheumatic fever. However, Severe rheumatic heart disease has its, has its own intrinsic prognosis because of the valves are too damaged and because of catching up with myocardial failure. Just to remind you of the morbidity of RHD, congestive cardiac failure, need for cardiac surgery, risk of bacterial endocarditis, pregnancy with undiagnosed mitral stenosis is, can be catastrophic. And for those that have got prosthetic valves or an atrial fibrillation, there's obviously a risk of stroke and embolic events. So best practice, rheumatic heart disease care is based on these, these factors, these aspects. So secondary prevention, obviously, again, so important to discuss that each review. It's the timely reviews by a specialist experienced in RHD management. It doesn't have to be a cardiologist as long as they've got access to high quality echocardiography. And the key with chronic rheumatic heart disease is not necessary to assess the detail of the severity, it's, if it's severe, it's to assess left ventricular function because that's the, going to be the key to deciding if you need to refer to heart surgery or not. Obviously, if those are on anticoagulation, it's, it's, that's a very important part of their management and as is access to dental health care. So just to remind you that severe Chronic mitral regurgitation is a volume load on the left ventricle with increasing LV stress over time, wall stress, and the same with chronic aortic regurgitation. Of course, mitral stenosis, if the, if the mitral regurgitation has evolved to mitral stenosis, has got a different pathogenesis, um, and it's not a, not a risk for the left ventricle, but it is a risk for left atrial dilatation and onset of atrial fibrillation. So if you're seeing adults with rheumatic heart disease, then you should just look at the latest American Heart Association or ACC guidelines or the, or the European Society guidelines because they're, they're based on huge numbers of studies. They, they've been updated every three to five years. 
So the indications for cardiac surgery in adults is severe mitral regurgitation with symptoms or if you're asymptomatic, but if your left ventricular end systolic dimension is greater than 40 millimeters in adults for the, for the Americans, the Europeans say it's a bit tight and would say 45 millimeters. So impaired ventricular function, pulmonary hypertension, or class two indication if the valve is judged to be repairable. In children, there's much less data, but we have studied this in, in New Zealand and there's three publications there. And so we've come up with the figures of, again, severe MR with symptoms, asymptomatic MR with impaired function, a systolic dimension of Z score greater than 2.5 or pulmonary hypertension. And the reason we have those Z scores of cutoff is that we found that looking at this cohort of 148 mitrals or combined mitral aortics, that if you have an, a systolic dimension of greater than four, that's an independent risk factor for not just impaired ventricular function, late ventricular function, but dysfunction, but also for death. So mitral valve surgery in adults, mitral valve repair is, has been proven to be better repair, better than replacement, lower operative mortality, better LV function, and less morbidity. There's multiple studies showing this. However, as you get older, not all uh, mitral valves are repairable. And in New Zealand, we also showed from our data retrospective cohort that mitral valve repair um, was better, decreased morbidity than mitral valve replacement. So the indications for surgeons, for females of rheumatic heart disease in the childbearing age is to counsel that to, that to avoid pregnancy, if you've ended up with a mechanical valve, it's very risky unless you're in a very high quality obstetric uh, management. And it's important to counsel surgeons that mitral valve repairs are preferable than replacement. If you can't replace the valve, then a bioprosthetic valve should be considered, even though they will need to be reoperated later. There's a lot of data to cover, and I just refer you um, to this textbook that came out that Liesl and I were both involved with. The chapter six, Medical Management of RHD, is a much fuller discussion. So thank you very much. I think at the end of my time, these are my acknowledgements.